This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between a woman and a policeman. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, Bumley Police Station. How can I help you? Yes, I need to report a stolen bag. Just a moment and I'll put you through to lost and stolen property. Hello, Sergeant Rhodes speaking. Can I help you? Yes, hello. I'd like to report a stolen bag. Hmm, OK, a stolen bag. Uh, we've been getting a lot of these lately. I'll need to get some details. Uh, let's see, uh, when was the last time you had your bag? Well, uh, about two hours ago. I just can't believe this has happened. I take it everywhere with me. It was given to me as a graduation present. I'm just so upset. Yes, I know. Uh, it's very frustrating. It seems like I put it down for a second and then it was gone. Yes. Look, the good news is that most of the stolen bags in our area are found, usually without the money. So I'd be surprised if you don't get it back later. Tell me, what does the bag look like? Well, it's dark blue, cylindrical. It has two carry handles either side of a zipper on top. Um, the zipper actually runs the length of the bag. It's a Vitoli bag. OK. Are there any other identifying marks on the bag? Things that would be unique to it. Um, name tags, scuff marks, that kind of thing. Well, not really. Um, there are a couple of scratches in the top left corner on one side of the bag near the handle and I think another one in the opposite corner. OK. Uh, scratches on opposite corners. Now... Where were you when the bag went missing? Well, I remember the time. It was a quarter past twelve. Oh, no, actually, it was a bit after that, more like 12.25, because I was supposed to meet one of my friends for lunch at 12.30. Anyway, I was standing outside the supermarket when all of a sudden a group of teenagers came walking past. They must have been heading towards the cinema. They seemed to be in a hurry and probably late for the movie, so I stepped aside to let them by. When they'd passed by, I reached down to pick up my bag and it was gone. I see. Now, can you remember the contents of the bag? Yes. Um, let's see, my passport and some traveler's checks. Fortunately, I was carrying my camera and I had my wallet in my pocket. They're the main valuable things. Um... OK. Uh, anything else at all? Hmm, let's see. No, I think that was it. Oh, a few pens, but that's all really. As I say, nothing of real value. OK. I'm going to have to get your details. Are you here on holiday? Yes, as a matter of fact, I am. I'm visiting from Canada. I've been here for three weeks already, but I'll be here for another month. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, uh, 
Uh, have you contacted your credit card company? Yes, I did that immediately. They were very helpful. I still can't believe this could happen to me. And while I'm supposed to be enjoying myself on holiday... Yes, it's a real disappointment, whether you're on holiday or not. Yeah, thieves strike when you least expect it. Anyway, I need to take down your particulars. Um, what's your name then? Yes, uh, my name is Helen Reddy. That's R-E-A-D-Y. My address is... Well, the place where I'm staying here is The Palms, Unit 14, 75 Paradise Avenue. OK, I may need your home address in Canada, but I'll get that more towards the time you're going to leave. Uh, what about the telephone? What number will I be able to reach you on? Yes, it's 455-91332. OK, uh, 455-91332. And how much do you think the bag and contents are worth? Well, it's not really a big cost. Probably only $100. It's the inconvenience of it all. I understand. Look, we have a lot of lost or stolen property recovered daily. Come by the station tomorrow and have a look. As I said, there's a high chance that we'll get the bag back. Your passport at the very least. OK, thanks for your help. See you tomorrow then. Bye. Yes, bye. That is the end of part one. Part two. You will hear a student counsellor giving information and advice about further study. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Are you thinking about further study? Well, listen to this before you make a decision. It will help you decide if going on to tertiary study is right for you, and it will help you make good decisions for the right reasons. It includes information about student life, what it will cost, and the different ways you can support yourself. What should you think about first? Well, obviously, you're thinking about tertiary study, and it's one of the biggest decisions you'll make in your life. What you decide now will affect the rest of your life. It's the last year of high school for most of you, and you're busy and under pressure. Perhaps you're thinking of going abroad, getting a job or working for just a year or two to save some money before getting back to study. Let's assume you're choosing to continue studying next year. It's important that you set yourself goals and plan how you're going to achieve them. First off, career goals. What career do you want to pursue, or what is it your parents want you to do? Then, you need to think about employment opportunities at the end of your study. Will your qualification assist you in finding a rewarding job? Thirdly, course selection. Exactly what qualifications will you need? For instance, a degree, a diploma, or something else? Now we're down to study goals. The number of papers you can study at a time, and what sort of grades you would like to attain. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Now, how do you make all that happen? You might feel overwhelmed by all the choices, but there are people and agencies to help. Career Services is a great website with lots of useful information and a search tool for finding courses and providers throughout the country. Then, there are the tertiary education institutions themselves. 
Universities and institutes of technology, for example, have comprehensive information on their particular websites. You can find out most anything there. Many campuses have a student support association, and they can tell you a lot about what to expect. Don't be afraid to ask them anything. I'm sure they've heard it all before. It might also be worthwhile to make inquiries with potential employers to see if they will fund or partially fund your studies. If it is a trade you want to learn, the apprenticeship scheme will help you earn while you learn. That way, you'll get valuable work experience while you're studying. If you're still at school, then search out your school careers advisor. Who will have a variety of information and resources at hand, and be able to give you the kind of guidance you need to make a fully informed decision. And last but not least, don't forget your parents and other family members; they can be of enormous help too. Oh, one last thing that might help you make up your mind: Have you thought of applying for a scholarship? Some embassies, governments, and individual institutions offer scholarships to cover part or all of your study fees. Most large libraries have a comprehensive catalogue of the various grants, awards, and scholarships that are available. That is the end of part two. Part three. You will hear two friends discussing what to study at Mitchford University. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-seven. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-seven. Hello, Gloria. Hi, Paul. I just heard that you're studying psychology this year. At the moment, that's true. But to be honest, I'm not sure exactly what to study. You're in your third year at university. Do you have any advice for me? Well, it's a difficult question for me to answer, but I do have some ideas based upon my personal experience that may be of help. Anything would be helpful at this point. I'm feeling a little worried about what I should do. Well, there are a few things that I would recommend. Firstly, ask yourself what do you really enjoy studying? For example, maths, English, science. This will help you decide what course you should do. The university handbook lists all the courses available. You should take some time to look at it. A couple of my friends spoke with recent graduates of courses which took up a lot of time. Another thing which took a lot of time was an interview at the dean of academic affairs office. They're always so busy there. Unless you've got a lot of time, I wouldn't bother with either of those ideas. Okay, Gloria, I understand there are some excellent publications that I can look at which will help answer my questions. But the trouble is, I'm having a real hard time locating them. Do you know where I might be able to go? Yes, I encountered this very same problem when I was deciding on what to study. I managed to locate a few excellent books that really helped me to decide what was best for me. Now some of the details will be a little inaccurate. That's no problem. If you could just remember the titles, I'll be able to look them up at the university library. Now let me just get my pen.、Uh, okay, ready? All right. The first book I found was What Should I Do. It was written by Paul Smith, and I believe it was published in 2000 by Smith Brothers. I think this was the best book I read. Although Judy Newton's "Choosing University Courses" was also an excellent help for me. Can you remember what year that one was published? Hmm. Let me see. Most of the books I read were published around the same year, 2000, I think. I can't remember who published it. I think it was Printers Limited. You'll have to check that one out yourself. No problem. This is just what I've been looking for. Anything else you could recommend? Yes, there was one other book which I remember because my cousin works for the publishers Brown and Tate. He started there in 2002. 
Anyway, the book's called Surviving University and was written by Julie White. It's an excellent book which came out in 2004. I certainly recommend it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. Gloria, this discussion has been so helpful. I wonder if I might ask one more question. Sure. What would you like to know? Well, I'm wondering why you finally decided to study psychology. Well, what helped me to decide was my interest in working with people. I think that's what you've got to really decide in your own mind. Do people give you energy or do they drain you of energy? I asked my friends what they thought of my idea, and most of them thought it was a good choice. Yeah, you know, I think my parents or family members who know me well would be a good place to start. Hmm. I think if you like to research subjects, you might prefer to work by yourself. That could help you to decide what area you should study. For me, I like working with numbers. And I knew psychology involved a lot of this, so that also helped me to choose my course of study. The bottom line is, you've really got to know what you naturally like to do. Once you work that out, you simply choose areas of study that relate to those things. Well, Gloria, I can't thank you enough for your time. Would you be interested in joining me for a coffee? That is the end of part three. And four. You will hear a talk about the effects of our digital world on young people. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty on pages seven and eight. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. In this lecture series, we're looking at changes occurring due to the rapid spread of digital technology in the last decades of the twentieth century. By digital technology, I include any computer-related devices such as email, the internet, cell phones, instant messaging, to name but a few. Today's lecture. Focuses on the ideas of Mark Prensky, and what he believes are the major effects that high exposure to digital technology has had on young people today. Firstly, what exactly does Prensky believe? He argues that because today's young people have been born into a digital world and spend hours simply playing with technology, they've changed in fundamental ways. He believes they're evolving differently. And as a result, process information differently from previous generations. It's even possible that these young people's brains have physically changed, although whether this is literally true isn't yet known. Nor does Prensky go quite this far. Prensky divides people into digital natives and digital immigrants. Today's young people are the digital natives, and they belong in this new digital age because they were born into it and grew up as native speakers of the digital language of computer technology. Whereas digital immigrants are those born in the generations before the digital age. Just as those who learn a second language often retain their foreign accent, the immigrants are usually, in varying degrees. Not quite as effective at speaking the digital language as the natives are. For example, they're more comfortable finding phone numbers using a phone book, 
or looking up information in an encyclopedia, rather than using the Internet as a primary source of information. Prensky calls this the digital accent. Another example of the digital accent is scanning a manual for a computer program rather than assuming the program itself will teach you how to use it. Basically, people with a digital accent have never really stopped relying on their original non-digital means of sourcing information. They prefer doing things as they've always done them without typing something into a computer. Prensky predicts that due to all this, changes are in store, mainly in the area of education. But what do other educators and theorists such as Thomas Allen, Samuel James, and Peter Vander believe? Samuel James, from Sydney University, agrees with Prensky's predictions. He believes that educators are no longer successful in the way they teach. However, not surprisingly, Prensky has been criticized by more traditional theorists, like Peter Vander and Thomas Allen. They disagree with many of Prensky's assertions. Vander argues that a typical classroom is more varied than Prensky believes, with students coming from a range of backgrounds. He maintains that a large percentage of these students are not necessarily proficient with technology, and not all students today fit the one stereotype. And Allen adds that even though most students today have easy access to technology, some just don't find the digital medium appealing. James disagrees, though. He believes that all today's students do share the same basic interest in and knowledge of digital technology. However, James believes our younger students can communicate with their digital immigrant teachers and can still learn using methods which have proven to be successful in the past. James's theories are taken a step further by Allen, who recognizes that both digital immigrants and natives have to deal with vast amounts of information in today's electronic society. Allen maintains that while most young students are proficient in playing computer games and using the web in quite basic ways, they're not used to using the computer at advanced levels. For example, to conduct complex information searches, which are so necessary for university study today. Irrespective of Allen's research, James believes it's possible for computer games to play a major role in making classroom learning more stimulating, and he cites many instances where this would be possible today. However, Vander asserts that rather than focusing on developing games, we should think of better ways to assist teachers because no computer program comes close to doing what a human teacher does every day. That is the end of section four.